All right, so as we've continued to talk about evolution, we've talked about a, a little bit about the process of natural selection and how that can lead to changes between organisms and that those changes can allow some individuals to have a higher fitness and thus their traits, their adaptations that help them to have a higher fitness will perpetuate within a population. They're gonna to continue to be passed on, right? And so now I wanna talk about the act of speciation. So the act of speciation is the creation of a new species. And this happens through those little changes that we talked about. Um, and it's just the collection of little changes over time until eventually you get two distinct species. And we're going to talk about how that happens as well as why that's important. And we've seen this happen within our lifetimes as well as we see evidence of it across you know, the entire fossil record, for instance, any of those evidence of evolution, um, lines of evidence that we talked about from the previous chapters, we have seen speciation occur in those lines. So just to kind of talk about how to create a species, if you will, we need to talk about what a species is. And so a species is a group of organisms that can reproduce together. And when they reproduce together, they have fertile offspring. Okay. So the offspring need to be able to have offspring of their own. And that's really, really important because some individuals of different species can interbreed, right? So a donkey and a horse, for instance, can interbreed and they'll have a mule. However, a mule is sterile. A mule cannot have its own offspring. And so we don't consider a horse and a donkey to be the same species just because they can have a child that child is sterile, so it's not the same species. Okay. And so mules actually are not a species at all, technically, because they cannot produce their own offspring. So technically mules are not a species and donkeys and horses are different species because the children that they do have are infertile, okay? they're sterile. So now that we've kind of talked about what a species is, that allows us to talk about what a population is, and this should be mostly review, but populations are basically when you get lots of individuals from a species living and interacting in the same area, right? So a population, everybody will be the same species within a population, but sometimes we're gonna have different populations that are close by. Okay, and so here we have a map of lion populations in Africa. You can see that they're kind of like grouped together uh, but they are somewhat nearby, okay? but they have like different ranges. So they might interact, but they're still distinct populations. They're not living in the same area most of the time. They're not generally competing for resources, but they might occasionally interact. And so speciation, again, is basically when you take one species and you turn it into two species. And I, when I say stuff like you take it and you do it, obviously we aren't doing this, although we have created new species ourselves. We're mostly talking about natural selection, this happening in nature. Okay? And so there are going to be two main types of speciation that we need to be familiar with that will occur in the wild. There's allopatric and there's sympatric. So allo, that root means different. Okay? And sim means similar or same. Okay? And so that's going to become important in their uh, definitions. So allopatric speciation is going to be way more common than sympatric. So allopatric, way more common. Okay? And that's when a population gets geographically isolated. Okay, So it's called allopatric because now they're in different, so allo is different, different places. Okay? And when you isolate a population, imagine taking some humans and putting them on an island where there's no airport, no boats ever go there, anything. They're going to start to act differently from the humans that do interact with other people, right? And so it's the same thing, and we'll talk about what that might look like, but you're taking a population, so you're just taking a group of organisms of that species, and you're putting them in a different place, so they're geographically isolated. And so there's no longer gene flow between that population and the original population or any other populations nearby. Okay, so there's basically going to be some kind of an isolation. So now this individual population cannot interact with these at all. That doesn't happen anymore. 
uh, for whatever reason. They're too geographically isolated. So that means that this gene flow, so this interaction of the genetics occurring between the populations gets cut off for one of them. Okay? The other three are still going to interact, but this one won't. And so over time, it's just interacting with itself. And when you just interact with yourself, you might see changes in the population over time. Okay? It's a smaller population now. There's less interaction, so maybe genetic drift is a bigger issue. Uh, there might be different selective pressures in this new isolated area. And so we might see differences in the allele frequencies. Okay. And so we can see this in a lot of different uh, taxa, a lot of different groups of organisms. Um, you can most easily picture this with something like fish. You can just picture like, oh, something about the river or the lake or whatever it is you're looking at, the pond, changes, and that causes some sediment to build up right here. Okay. And so now I have a population on the right and on the left. They used to intermingle. There used to be gene flow between the two. But now that there's a barrier, there's a geographic barrier, now they can't interact anymore. There's no more gene flow going between them, right? No alleles are being passed between those two little populations. And so once that happens, we have selection and genetic drift acting differently on these populations. So maybe over here we get more sunlight. And so maybe that allows certain plant types to grow. Or maybe there's some predators that ended up on this side that aren't on this side. And so having a certain coloration might be better on the left side, right? And now it's just a smaller population on the left. So maybe the random chances of getting mutations that will cause color to change and then the random chance of those color changes to be passed on to offspring will have a larger effect on that population. So that would be genetic drift, right? So any of these things can affect these populations differentially now that they are of different sizes and they no longer have gene flow between them, okay? So that's allopatric, that's more common. This right here, this image is showing a sympatric speciation. And so this is going to occur when organisms within a population become reproductively isolated. So that's as opposed to the geographic isolation we saw before. So in sympatric speciation, they still live in the same area. That's why it's sim, okay? So sim refers to same or similar. And so sympatric, they still live in the same place, right? So they can still interact. We see that there's no barrier stopping them from interacting in this case, okay? So they still inhabit the same area, but they have become reproductively isolated. And that can happen a number of ways. Uh, often it's because of the number of chromosomes. Uh, so that's what they mean by polyploidy. So maybe an individual has one too many chromosomes. So like these blue individuals, perhaps they have one too many chromosomes and that just happens by random chance, right? Meiosis makes mistakes. And so if these two individuals were both made from, you know, a non-disjunction mistake in meiosis, then they have too many chromosomes. That means they can't mate with these orange individuals, but perhaps they can mate with each other. And if they mate with each other, they might have blue kids, right? Blue fish children. Okay? And so then you would just see those differences perpetuate over and over and over again. You would continue to see, oh, there's blue individuals and there's orange individuals. And their DNA is no longer that similar because now one has too many chromosomes compared to the other. Okay, so now that we've talked about allopatric and sympatric speciation, I want to talk a little bit about isolation. So I mentioned isolation in both of those examples because it is important. We had the geographic isolation of allopatric speciation, and we had the reproductive isolation of sympatric isolation, or excuse me, speciation. So speciation leads to all of the diversity we've seen on life, right? Like every single different organism you have ever seen is the result of speciation. And generally, speciation is caused by isolation okay, of either of those kinds. So isolation is quintessential to natural selection and evolution. It is kind of what drives uh, different species to form. Okay? And so just to recap, in reproductive isolation, okay, so we saw that with the sympatric speciation event, we have some kind of a barrier that prevents species from producing fertile offspring. Uh, 
It could be a non-disjunction event, for instance. Okay. For some reason, we have gene flow interrupted between populations, but they still live in the same area. Okay. And we're going to talk about what kind of uh, reproductive isolation events there might be. So we have prezygotic. Okay. So let's just think about that word, prezygotic. So pre means before. Zygotic, well, zy that sounds like zygote, right? So let's think back to meiosis and reproduction, Mendel, all that stuff, right? So a zygote is a baby. So these are barriers that occur before you make a zygote. So before you actually have the mating and fertilization. Uh, and I have a misspelling of fertilization here, my bad. So prezygotic barriers are going to be anything that stops mating from happening or that stops fertilization from happening. Okay. So these could be geographic barriers. Okay. They, you might just be you're not in the same place at the same time. Uh, they could be temporal, so they could be timing-based. Maybe one population is out only at night, and the other population is out during the day. If they're not interacting, they're not going to mate, right? It could be behavioral. Perhaps one population prefers a male to do a specific kind of dance in order to, uh, you know, court a female, to win over a female but the other one prefers a different dance or a different song or anything like that. It could be mechanical. It could be that their parts just don't match up, right? And so we see that in birds. So like, for instance, most birds have cloaca, right? So cloaca is kind of like an all-in-one hole. Uh, that's where they pee from. That's where they poop from. That's where they have sexual reproduction from, all that stuff. That's where they lay eggs from. Basically, everything except eating is done in that hole, right? But other birds, like ducks, have more traditional penis vagina genitalia okay? and so you're not gonna have those two things working together very well right so that could be a mechanical issue uh, and then there could just be habitat issues if you always hang out inside or around a pond you're not going to encounter any populations that are away from a pond right and so you might just not see them and so that kind of like the line between habitat and geographic barriers kind of gets blurred and that's totally okay. Um, it, it's just important because like habitats can be really small. You might have a larger geographic area that contains like 12 habitats within, you know, a couple of like one square mile, for instance. Okay. So geographic isolation is when populations get separated by some kind of a barrier, right? And so I showed you this with the fish examples, but it can be mountains, it can be bodies of water, it can be a physical rift in the ground, it can be basically anything that prevents one thing from reaching another. And so, especially when you're dealing with organisms that cannot fly or cannot leave the water, you're going to see this a lot. Because if anything gets in the way of that water, or if anything, you know, separates the two areas of land, they're not going to be able to interact with the other side. Okay. And so this was the biggest thing that Darwin proposed about the Galapagos Islands. He proposed that there were such big differences between the organisms. So remember, he looked at the tortoises there and he looked at the birds. But obviously, a lot of birds might be able to uh, fly between islands right? if the distance isn't too great. And so we'll talk about that a little bit. But the tortoises certainly can't swim. Uh, and so they're stuck on the island. And so over time, you're going to see that that isolation leads to them becoming very, very different from one another. And we can see this even in California. So in California, we have some salamanders. Okay? This is their genus, the Incent, uh, excuse me, Incentina species. Okay? Or excuse me, this is the species that showed up. And so we have these different little like subspecies, these different populations that show up in all of these different areas of California. California is amazingly biodiverse. There is an amazing amount of diversity in the life of California, and this is just looking at one group of organisms. So just imagine anything else that we have here, because we have insanely different uh, geography. We have the Central Valley right here. We've got some mountains over here. We've got a coastline, right? We have shrubland. We have even a desert. We have just about everything in California. It's pretty nuts. So that kind of ends geographic isolation because it's kind of the easiest for us to talk about, right? It's easy to picture, easy to diagram. So temporal isolation 
is going to be when the reproductive system, so it might apply to reproductive systems or it might apply to the fact that uh, you don't encounter each other at the same time of the day. But basically there's some kind of a time disconnect, right? So that's what temporal means. It's referring to time. So perhaps their cycles, right? If they have an organism with some kind of a reproductive cycle, don't match up, right? They're not fertile when the other one is fertile. And so that's what we have down here with these crickets. We have, excuse me, a spring field cricket and a fall field cricket. And so their name refers to when they are fertile. Okay? And so obviously they're not going to mate because that time never overlaps. Okay. So we also have the American toad on the left, and that's going to mate in the early summer, while the fowler toad, which is on the right, you may look at them and notice that they are quite similar, but they mate at different times. So they're never going to have gene flow between those populations because they're never going to reproduce at the same time. Okay. And so plants can do the exact same thing, and we actually see it in plants all the time because they bloom at different times, they release pollen at different times, etc. And so we can track this often most easily in plants. Um, but we, you know, as humans generally like to look at more interesting looking things than plants, even though plants are actually quite cool. That takes us to my personal favorite, which is behavioral isolation. And so behavioral is basically anytime there's incompatibility between the mating practices of one population and another. And so there's something, you know, you're trying to do something to win over a mate and they're just not interested in what you're doing. Okay? So it could be songs, it could be mating rituals, it could be dances, it could be a change in a pheromone. That's a thing that we often forget about. But pheromones are super important in attracting a mate. And in fact, they're even really important in attracting a human mate. There's a lot of interesting research done on the pheromones released by and, you know, smelled by uh, humans and what effect that has on level of attractiveness to another individual. So how you respond to that is going to refer to the behavior. Okay. So, for example, male fireflies will attract females of their species by flashing a specific pattern of their light. It's very, very specific. To us, it looks the same, right? We don't really notice unless we're like staring at it and we're just like, that becomes our entire life is just staring at these fireflies doing their thing. You know, like if you're a really boring entomologist or something. And so they're going to be flashing their light in just the right way. And to us, it looks the same, but to a female firefly, they know that it has to be their specific uh, pattern being flashed in order to be interested. And so if you're flashing the wrong pattern, they're just not going to be interested. Okay. We also have mechanical isolation. And so this, again, is when you have some kind of a structural difference in genitalia that prevents the organisms from being able to successfully mate. It could be a lot of different things. Um, I already gave you one very vivid visual example, and so I don't think I need to give you another. But um, just in case, in Africa, there are over 20 species of bush babies, and they all have different shaped genitalia. And so males can only successfully mate with females that have the right complement, right? So because they have different genitalia, it's kind of like a puzzle piece. If you don't have the right piece, it won't fit. Okay. So that takes us to habitat isolation, the last of the different forms of isolation that we talked about. Um, that I introduced you to just a few minutes ago. And so this is when members of populations rarely encounter each other despite living in the same area. So for example, we have two different snake populations here. The top snake lives in the water and the bottom one lives on the land. They live in the same geographic region. Often it might even be like feet from each other, but they don't encounter each other and don't mate. So there's no gene flow because one is in the water and one is on land. And they're not going to leave their habitat. Okay. So that takes us to the end of the prezygotic barriers to mating. So of course, if there's a prezygotic barrier, there's going to be a postzygotic barrier. So a postzygotic barrier is going to be something that stops these two populations from having successful children. But they make the child, right? Or they, they at least create a zygote. Right? That's why it's post-zygotic, because they did make the zygote, and now we're talking about something went wrong after. Okay? And so maybe it's stopping the individuals from becoming a fertile adult, or 
perhaps it is lethal to the individual at a certain age, right? Basically, you're going to see this with hybrid species a lot. If you have two different species and they can make a baby, but that baby is not fertile, so in the case of mules, for instance, it's going to be a post-zygotic barrier. They made a zygote. That zygote grew into an embryo. The embryo grew into an individual, right? There was a baby, and it just didn't have the capability of reproducing itself. And so even if you get two mules together, they're not going to reproduce. A mule and a horse won't reproduce. A mule and a donkey won't reproduce. There's no combination there that works. Therefore, it's not going to be a fertile offspring. Uh, and so that's a post-zygotic barrier. And your book will talk a little bit about different hybrid variability, or excuse me, viability. And you don't need to worry too much about that. Just know that some hybrids work better than others. Um, but generally, if the hybrid is not able to reproduce and have offspring that are able to reproduce, then it is not a species. Okay. And so when you have this reproductive isolation, right, whether it be prezygotic or postzygotic, when you have reproductive isolation, you're going to get a bunch of different species, right? Just one at a time, you're going to evolve a new species because for some reason, this person's not interested in mating with this person, or maybe they physically can't mate, right? And so those populations become reproductively isolated. And when you become isolated, those differences just kind of start to accumulate. And you just become so different that then even if you wanted to, you couldn't mate and have successful children, right? And so here are some videos on reproductive isolation and a little bit on why this can occur in some species. So for instance, that why can't mules have babies video is really interesting. Um, but ultimately, I need you to know why isolating two populations, even if they're not geographically isolated, but reproductively isolating them, may cause them to speciate, to become two different distinct species. Right. And so one of the things that you might encounter when we start talking about speciation is polyploidy. So let's think about that word. Poly means many. Ploidy refers to how many copies of every chromosome you have. So we've seen this before. We saw this in meiosis, right? We saw that we are diploid organisms. And when we make gametes, they are haploid, right? So I would take one copy of each of these chromosomes, and that could be a gamete that I would make, right? Some organisms are triploid, some organisms are tetraploid, and you know basically any number you can think of, there's a number of chromosomes for that, right? Um, like the highest I can think of is like 32, right? And so this basically is a result of errors during meiosis, and sometimes it's not lethal, right? So if you have too many chromosomes in a human, often it is lethal to the zygote, but sometimes it isn't. So for instance, Down syndrome is caused by a third copy of chromosome 21. Um, and so if those individuals who have the wrong number of chromosomes are able to successfully mate, then perhaps over time, they would create their own distinct species that has that number of chromosomes every single time. Okay. And so if you have an individual who is accidentally triploid, right, they have accidentally too many chromosomes, they're not going to be able to mate with a normally diploid individuals. And so we're not going to be able to have a viable offspring. And so you're going to see that that's one of the ways by which we have prezygotic uh, or postzygotic reproductive isolation. Um, so again, sympatric speciation is rarer than allopatric, but we see it a lot in plants because they can self-fertilize. Basically, their own sperm can fertilize their own eggs. Okay? Um, whereas polyploid animals have to find somebody who has the same number of chromosomes. And so that's really difficult. Like this animal and another animal of the opposite sex had to have the same number of chromosomes, but not the normal number. So something had to go wrong twice. And so it's really, really rare that they're going to find each other and successfully mate. But plants can kind of do it with themselves. So if plants get the wrong number of chromosomes, they can just mate with themselves. So yeah, it'll, it's just going to perpetuate in that individual. And so that's why like a lot of the chromosome numbers that get really large, like that 32 or something around 32 is watermelon. Um, 
there's a lot of plants that are going to have weird numbers of chromosomes, weird numbers of copies of chromosomes, I should say. So some organisms are going to speciate faster than others. Okay. And there's a lot of things that go into that. So, so some species are going to form faster than others. And one of the biggest things that you need to realize is this thing called adaptive radiation. Okay. So adaptive radiation is this amazing thing. And it's basically one group of organisms very rapidly diversify into many new forms. So it's basically speciation on steroids. Uh, so rather than like over the course of a thousand years making one new species, in that same amount of time, we make hundreds, right? And so what you're often going to see is that this will occur when a group of organisms makes it to a new area. Okay? So if a group of organisms makes it to a new area where there's not much competition, there's tons of resources. And so there's tons of stuff that could be exploited if only these organisms had the ability to exploit it. Okay. And so what we see is that if you introduce a new organism to a new area that doesn't have anything else in its what we call niche space, okay, so like what it needs to do in its environment, then you're going to see very rapidly that these organisms are going to diversify and speciate in order to fill that niche space. So like if there were a bunch of flowers on an island that nobody was getting the nectar from, well, then you better believe that the first bird that can come around and get nectar from it is going to benefit because now there's a ton of food for him. So he's going to do great. He's going to be able to have a lot of children, right? And so the, the classic example that we see here is Darwin's example, Darwin's finches example. Okay, so those underwent adaptive radiation. Basically, it's hypothesized that some birds got flown into the island chain through a hurricane or some other form of storm. And once they got there, there was tons of food. And so little changes would just perpetuate within the population. And so they'd be able to utilize more and more resources. Okay. Another example are the Hawaiian honey creepers, which are not actually doing super great right now because of avian malaria. But um, basically, when the first birds made it to Hawaii, right, they had tons of resources available to them. And so over a you know, relatively short amount of time, not like two years. It's, it's still a long time, geographically speaking, right? But when you consider the history of the earth, it's not that long. Um, all those little changes that were beneficial to them allowed them to become a bunch of different species. And so here on the left, I have a picture of the Hawaiian honey creepers. And so this individual is now, after so long, genetically distinct from this individual species and they can no longer mate or they choose not to mate, right? So there's either a prezygotic or a postzygotic isolation of those organisms. And so as we start to talk about how we create new species over time, we're going to use this term punctuated equilibrium. Okay? And so in punctuated equilibrium, new species are going to change the most when they diverge from parent species. Okay? So basically, most of the changes in the species are going to occur early, like as soon as they diverge from the original species. All right, so here I have one species becoming what will eventually lead to two lineages. Okay? We're going to see a lot more changes early on. That's what is happening at each of these branching points that we're going to see later on. Okay. Basically, as soon as they're away from the parent species, as soon as they're different enough from the parent species, we're going to see fewer changes in this case. Okay. And so we see this a lot in the fossil record, and I want to talk about that a little bit in class because it's important to think back to the evidence of evolution chapter. But what really becomes important is when we start talking about gradualism. So gradualism is a theory that states that species descended from a common species and over time have gradually changed. Okay, so that's why it's called gradualism, because it's very slow change over time. Okay, and all of those little changes will accumulate. So like, yeah, maybe it's just one slightly different hue of yellow on the wing, but that will combine with a slightly different color orange on the body or whatever. And all of these little changes occur and they add up real fast until at the end of it, we have two lineages. Even though they 
came from ancestors, from one common ancestor down here at the bottom, we have two very distinct species by the end of it in not that long of a time. Okay. And it's pretty rare to find <clears throat> the middle ground. Okay. So like these guys, because they're not like quite the end product, these are what we would call transition organisms. Okay. So we would expect to see like little changes, right? And that's what a transition organism is. It's like, okay, I have this organism and I think that it came from this organism. So I would expect to see some little changes over time in organisms to show me what that would look like. And so that's what's happening in each of these lineages. The problem is that fossils are really rare. Fossils don't form very often. There's a few things that determine whether a fossil will form, but basically a lot of it comes down to random chance and environment and also the structure of the tissue of the organism itself. So there's not a lot of fossils to go around. And so often you won't see this transition organism because there's no fossil of it. Right? And so you just have to kind of imagine what it would look like. And so that's one of the things that a lot of skeptics will say. They will say, like, well, you haven't found the the transition organism. Well, you go find it because it's really hard to find a fossil when not very many of them are made. Right. So just to kind of summarize overall speciation, here are some really good videos to introduce you to how one species becomes two. And differentiating between gradualism and punctuated equilibrium, um, as well as some interesting examples of species and their inability to create species when they reproduce. So that would be the case of like ligers. So ligers are real um, and there's a lot wrong with them, but basically it's kind of like the mule situation where they are not fertile themselves. Okay, so they are not species. And so now that we've talked about speciation, I do want to talk a little bit about extinction because it's kind of the opposite of speciation, right? So extinctions are really, really rapid when there's ecological stress. So when the, the environment changes rapidly, there's going to be more extinctions. And so we've seen this a lot of major times in the history of life. But we are definitely seeing it now as humans have changed the environment so drastically. Um, and so basically, almost all of the species that have existed on Earth are dead now, right? And so part of that is normal. Like, the world changes, right? Like, nobody is saying that the world doesn't change on its own. But we are also changing it quite drastically, right? And so there are five major extinction events that have occurred and i don't need you to get bogged down in any of the specific time periods or any of the specific species that died or how many of them died during that time just realize like in some of these extinction events like 50 percent of animal families died 35 percent of animal families at the time died 60 percent in the Permian extinction, 30% in the Devonian extinction, et cetera, et cetera. You, just huge numbers of organisms are dying because the environment changes really rapidly when something, oh, I don't know, like, you know, an asteroid or meteorite hits the earth, right? Things change quickly. Um, and we just happen to also be changing them quickly ourselves. Okay. And so extinction events are generally brought on by some kind of a drastic change, right? It could be a volcanic change. It could be a sea level change. It could be global warming, global cooling, whether that be human caused or not. And now it's definitely partly human caused, right? Um, but there have been rapid, there has been rapid global cooling and warming in the past that was not human caused, right? Like there was an ice age, right? Multiple. So it's important to make that distinction between what is human caused and what isn't. There's definitely a lot going on that is human caused. Even if you want to argue about climate change until the, the cows go home, there's deforestation to talk about, right? There are wildfires that could have been prevented. There are oil spills, right? There's so much going on, plastic pollution, so much going on that is at least partly caused by humans, but generally completely caused by humans. And so what we actually see is that as the size of human population has increased, the impact of human populations has increased, right? And so we've been growing relatively exponentially lately. And so our impact is also growing relatively exponentially. And so we live in now what is often referred to as the sixth mass extinction because 
we have wreaked a lot of havoc on organisms. Uh, you know, like a lot of predators, we decided we don't want to live around. And so we've killed a lot of predators, you know, kind of on purpose. We've changed the climate so drastically that a lot of things can't evolve to adapt quickly enough. Right. And so there's so much I would love to talk about with extinction. And it's so important that we have these conversations. And so I do want to, and not just in my class, I just mean as a species, we need to be having these conversations. And so I do want to spend some class time talking about this. But in the meantime, please do a little bit of research on mass extinctions and specifically on the sixth mass extinction, as it is called now, the one that we are in right now and we are all contributing to. Because even if you live, the you know most environmentally friendly lifestyle you're still contributing and you're still part of a society that's contributing and it's really important that we are at least actively thinking about that and that we are actively measuring our impact and trying to mitigate it so with that that's going to end speciation and extinction which is just a super exciting and super not depressing at all topic <laughs>